and see if this imitates the basic blueprint for story. Things were once good. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. Then something awful happens. I'll make a quick note. Whenever you see the words, one day, at the beginning of a sentence or a paragraph or a new chapter, Get ready, because something is about to happen. One day, dot, 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 something is going to happen. So you'll see that in the story of Job, and I'll try to accentuate our one days. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge of protection? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself you must not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has, who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking in the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In this, in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and, the Satan, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you been? Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands. 
but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. And then a journey is taken. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from the distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. But they're getting ready to say quite a few words. Seven days of silence leads us into 35 chapters of, of going, uh, argument of them discoursing over why Job is suffering. Um, so Job uh, had a long row to hoe with those three friends of his because for 35 chapters they kind of berate him on what is it, why is it that he sinned? What kind of secret sin is he holding on to? Why would God be doing this to him? Why would this suffering come? And they all have different answers. And at the last possible moment, the hero, God, Sets things right again. Chapters 38 through 41, God comes onto the scene with Job and in a pretty powerful way. For the last 35 chapters, they've been asking a lot of questions of God. They've had a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of doubt about why this suffering has come. And now God has come and he's, he's had enough of the questions. And he's got a few questions of his own for Job so that he can humble Job. And he asks Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Were, were you there when I stretched a measuring tape across the universe? Do you know how hard it is to get the sky to stay up in the sky? We pick it up in chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Ilphaz, the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right, and as my servant, uh, as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz, the Timonite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And he lived happily ever after. Verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house, and they comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the later part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, and the first Kizha, and the third Karen Hoppich. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, 